Uh, Trump has said he wants to end it in a day. How? Yeah, truth is, no one knows with certainty. But uh, Trump gave a number of clues in various campaign rallies and speeches uh, recently. And from those clues, there's a fairly straightforward presumption on it. It goes like this. Trump says to Zelensky, that's it. No more U.S. financial or military aid if you keep fighting. you got to stop. And Ukraine's got to give up the land Russia has by now taken. In other words, it's over. To Putin, he says, all right, you get all that land, but then nothing more. And by the way, the U.S. will then lift some of those sanctions. If Putin then says no to a ceasefire, Trump would threaten him with ever more aid for Ukraine at a time Russia can barely afford to keep fighting. The upside to both countries, the war is over. No more people dying. The downside for Ukraine is the map is redrawn in Putin's favor, and no one can say for sure he won't start up again sometime down the line. Trump, meanwhile, gets to keep his pledge to end it and frames himself the global deal maker. But all of it basically hinging on both sides capitulating under Trump's threat. Do it or else. Capitulating, that's got to be a rough word in Ukraine. Breyer, you spend a lot of time there. You, you talk with people all the time there. What, what is the reaction to that possibility and, and to Trump's claim that he can just end the three-year war immediately? Yeah, Adrian, there is quite a bit of skepticism, and that's accompanied by the fear that Trump could, as Paul said, kind of block the supply of weapons and pressure Ukraine into negotiating. But I have to say, we've also talked to people who really are hopeful that Trump follows through because it's been more than two and a half years of war and people are exhausted. And I think there is a a real worry about where this all could be headed because you have Russian troops advancing in the southeast of Ukraine at really their fastest rate since the early days of the invasion. And Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky, he spoke to Trump after his election win and he called the conversation constructive. And he did later say that he thinks the war will end sooner with Trump in the White House. Now, when it comes to Ukraine's other allies, I did a speak with uh, the NATO Secretary General recently, Adrian, and I believe you have part of that interview. Yeah, we do. This, this is just a little bit of your conversation with uh, Mark Ruta. Well, Donald Trump was the president who really started anew after it was initiated in 2014. When he became president in 2017, he really invigorated the whole debate about defense spending. Uh, and no doubt he will push us again to do more, uh, to take a bigger share of the burden. So at least publicly, he isn't expressing fear of Trump abandoning NATO in Ukraine. He thinks Trump that will act, uh, will act as a motivator, really, to try to get other NATO allies to spend more on defense. So, so there's the nudge, right, to, to NATO countries like Canada to expect calls to contribute more. But, but it still doesn't answer what will happen with the United States, which is by far the biggest military aid contributor to Ukraine. So I, I want to show you a, a picture of a man here who, who matters in this. This is John Thune. He is the newly elected Senate Majority Leader. Uh, he also has some sway over what happens in Ukraine, at least when it comes to funding. I guess this is a reminder, Paul, that it's not always all about Donald Trump. Yeah, John Thune will be a very powerful person in the new U.S. Senate. In the past, he's supported the need for U.S. aid to Ukraine, but effectively speaking, He'd need full congressional approval on uh, that and, as well, presidential sign-off. So it's complicated for him. Besides, don't ever underestimate the Trump effect on how Republicans behave. Senator Marco Rubio, for example, Trump's pick to be Secretary of State, used to support aid for Ukraine. His view now, there needs to be a negotiated end. Look, Trump is a force right now, so it's hard to see any in his party going against his will on this. Meanwhile... Joe Biden still has two months to go in office. Let's not forget that. We saw his move this week allowing Ukraine for the first time to fire U.S. missiles into Russia and the fallout from that. So at least for the moment, Biden plays a role in Ukraine as well. Paul, on that point, I want to call up a clip here from Russian politician Maria Butina on that very point. Have a listen. The involvement of NATO might mean a serious conflict that will be a danger for the whole world. Okay, just just a short clip there, but Breyer clearly the Kremlin, it, you know, is not mincing words there. Where does all this leave Trump's plan to end the war? 
Well, I think it's hard to say exactly because Trump hasn't given any specifics on what he would propose. But I will say that it's pretty clear that the Kremlin is sending out messages through Russian state media and Western publications, basically outlining under what conditions the Kremlin and Russia might consider a peace deal. In fact, today Reuters ran a report saying that Vladimir Putin uh, would agree to uh, some kind of deal but wouldn't give up any Ukrainian territory and would insist that Ukraine doesn't join NATO. Well, of course, these are non-starters for Kyiv. So with two seemingly entrenched positions, it's hard to see where this leads. I will say that uh, Vice President-elect J.D. Vance has outlined somewhat of his vision for how there might be an agreement. He talked about a scenario where there would be a demilitarized zone in Ukraine and the conflict would be frozen along the front lines. But even today, that's something that the Kremlin said it would not support. Yeah, and if I can just jump in, you know, because then there's the relationship between Trump and Putin, well documented, but for so many, still a complete mystery. Despite all the investigations, lots of people still wonder if Putin's got something on Trump or if it's simply the case Trump admires Vladimir Putin. Either way, it's clear they have a relationship. That new Bob Woodward book uh, recounts a story unproven that Trump secretly sent Putin COVID testing machines for personal use at a time Americans were desperate for them. I mean, what accounts for that, right? Um, there's certainly evidence Russia tried to rig the 2016 election in favor of Trump, and again this year. And on Ukraine, uh, Trump called Putin's invasion genius. I mean, their relationship and what it means to the world and Ukraine remains a puzzler and an unsettling one. Yeah, I think people are going to try to figure that relationship out for a while. But Breyer, last thought to you. Uh, Putin also praised Trump when he won uh, this year's election. What do you take from what he said, how he said, and when he said it? Yeah, Adrian, it was a carefully crafted response because the Kremlin came out and said that Putin didn't call to congratulate Trump after the election, unlike other world leaders. Uh, but Putin's reaction came the day after while he was speaking at a forum. And during a question and answer session, he praised Trump. He called him courageous, saying that he acted manly in terms of how he responded to uh, the attempted uh, assassination. And, and he has said basically that he respects Trump's desire to try and rebuild Russian relations and solve what Putin calls the Ukraine crisis. All right, Breyer Stewart, Paul Hunter, thank you both. You're welcome.